Hi, this is the AI Storyteller. I'm Mark. The book we are going to explore in this issue is the classic science fiction masterpiece by Jules Verne, 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. According to statistics from the United Nations Educational, Scientific and Cultural Organization, Jules Verne is the second most translated author in the world, second only to Agatha Christie. Worldwide, there are nearly 5,000 translations of Verne's works. Among all his works, 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea can be considered the most influential. It has not only won the love of countless readers but has also extended its influence into popular culture. The world's first nuclear-powered submarine was named after the submarine in 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, called the Nautilus. Although Verne was very popular with readers and was even referred to as the father of science fiction alongside H.G. Wells and Hugo Jernsback, there was one thing that bothered him and remained a lifelong regret. Despite his efforts, and even enlisting the help of his good friend Alexander Dumas, he was never elected to the French Academy. In Verne's eyes, this indicated that the mainstream literary world did not recognize his literary creations. So, does science fiction have any literary value? If it does, where does it specifically manifest? In this audio segment, we'll first tell the story, experience Verne's boundless imagination through the narrative, and then analyze the story to see how the literary value of science fiction is achieved. In 1869, 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea began serializing in the magazine of education and recreation. The publisher of this magazine was Henri Herzl, the most successful publisher of the time, and the editor of Balzac and Baudelaire. To make a strong start, Verne and Herzl chose the theme of the ocean for the first story. They did so partly because Verne had a deep connection with the sea from a young age. It's said that at the age of 11, Verne secretly found a job on a ship and planned to follow it to the Indian Ocean. However, he was caught by his father before leaving France. On the other hand, as maritime industry developed, people had some basic knowledge of the ocean's surface, but the underwater world remained a mysterious unknown, both frightening and intriguing. The main plot of the novel follows the adventures of the naturalist I and Captain Nemo as they pilot the Nautilus, traveling for ten months through the Pacific Ocean. Indian Ocean, Red Sea, Mediterranean Sea, Atlantic Ocean, and more, experiencing various adventures and witnessing wonders. This kind of adventure novel places high demands on the storyline, requiring dramatic ups and downs and a plethora of suspense. The author also needs to exercise a vivid imagination while staying rooted in reality, incorporating elements of fantasy. However, if the plot is too extravagant, it's easy to overlook character development, resulting in flat characterizations. Next, we'll follow the storyline of 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea and see if it manages to balance both aspects. Verne was a seasoned writer. At the beginning of the novel, he didn't rush into the main theme of a global journey. Instead, he spent a whole six chapters setting the atmosphere. Ships were constantly being attacked at sea, but who were the attackers? A giant whale? Unknown sea creatures from the depths? Or terrifying man-made machines? The mysterious description stirred readers' curiosity and fear, including the protagonist in the book, I. So, when I was invited to board the Lincoln to chase after this elusive monster, he accepted. As we discussed when interpreting Robinson Crusoe earlier, the use of the first-person narrative approach subtly brings readers closer to the novel, enhancing its authenticity and readability. In the following interpretation, to maintain this sense of immersion, I will refer to the protagonist as I. Please keep this in mind. After sailing for a while at sea, the Lincoln finally encountered the monster and decided to attack it, only to be thrown into chaos by the creature. I fell into the water, and when his life was in jeopardy, he accidentally climbed onto a submarine. Surprisingly, the so-called monster was this submarine. Then, Several strong men suddenly emerged from the submarine and locked I in a chamber inside. What a turn of events. Luckily, I had two fellow captives, a peculiarly named servant named Consile and Ned Land, a harpoonist from the Lincoln. After being locked up for several days, we finally met the central character of the novel, Captain Nemo. He actively invited I to explore the underwater world, but as a condition of this exchange, I could never return to the surface. 
Ai's curiosity was immediately piqued. Why did Captain Nemo despise the land so much? Before he could ponder this question, Captain Nemo took Ai on a tour of the Nautilus. During the tour, I discovered that Captain Nemo was a genius engineer who had designed the Nautilus. Moreover, he had exquisite taste, playing the pipe organ and being well-read. However, upon careful observation by I, there was not a single political book on the captain's bookshelves. Why was that? Just as one question remained unanswered, a new one arose. Don't be mistaken into thinking that Captain Nemo was a reclusive bookworm hiding in the depths. He was actually highly skilled in human interaction. For instance, the book mentioned that the captain had several captives narrate the sinking of the Lincoln in different languages, from which he deduced that they were not collaborating or lying. The beauty of the underwater world solidified I's determination to stay on the submarine. But how would they solve the issues of clothing, food, shelter, and transportation? This is where Verne's imagination continued to shine. They dined on turtle meat, dolphin liver, and cream made from whale milk. Their clothing came from the filaments of shellfish. The soft mattresses were made from seaweed. Whale whiskers served as paintbrushes, and ink was collected from squid ink. The submarine's lighting and power were entirely electric. In the real world, the widespread use of electric lighting didn't occur until the 1870s. Thanks to Verne, the characters in the novel were using electric lights a decade earlier. Verne used imagination and scientific knowledge to construct a self-sustaining underwater world that fascinated future scientists and inventors. As mentioned earlier, the world's first nuclear-powered submarine was named after the Nautilus. With thousands of marine species to choose from, why did they select the Nautilus? It's because the unique structure of the Nautilus provided inspiration for the construction of submarines. The Nautilus's shell is divided into over 30 separate chambers by transverse partitions, except for the last large chamber where the creature resides. All others are filled with gas. As the creature grows, these chambers are periodically pushed outward, creating new partitions. Between these chambers is a thin tube that allows gas to be distributed among them, controlling buoyancy and movement, which is precisely how the submarine operates. While life aboard the Nautilus was comfortable, the vast underwater world continued to pique the curiosity of I and the readers. How different was it from the familiar world on land? The opportunity finally arrived when Captain Nemo invited I to hunt in the underwater forest. We donned diving suits and air tanks, walking on the fine sands of the seabed. Schools of fish replaced lions and tigers, and colorful corals adorned the underwater forest. We strolled through arriving at the dark depths of an underwater canyon. After this initial intimate encounter with the underwater world, the sea remained calm for a while. However, one day, Captain Nemo locked us up without a word for the night. What happened that evening? Why the need to restrict our freedom? I had a head full of questions that remained unanswered as we were summoned to tend to injured sailors inside the submarine. Unfortunately, one of the sailors succumbed to his injuries and the grieving captain arranged an underwater burial. I thus witnessed the coral kingdom. In a secluded coral forest, there was a cemetery with crosses naturally formed from coral growth. Coral polyps gradually enveloped the graves, ensuring eternal peace for the deceased sailors, undisturbed by the outside world or sharks. This loss of crew members and the somber mood that followed brought everyone's emotions to a low point. Captain Nemo proposed a new plan. Since we were in the waters near Ceylon, Sri Lanka, why not visit a pearl diving site? As we toured, the captain explained the Chinese method of cultivating pearls, inserting a small piece of glass or metal into the flesh folds of a mollusk. In response to this irritation, the mollusk continuously secreted pearl material, encasing the foreign object and forming a pearl. While discussing this, a shadow suddenly loomed. Initially, we thought it was a shark, but upon closer examination, it turned out to be pearl divers hard at work. The conditions they endured were extremely harsh. They often dived without any protective gear, leading to frequent ear and eye issues, and they had to be on guard against shark attacks. Despite these challenges, their rewards were meager. Thinking it was a false alarm, we were preparing to leave when we realized that the unarmed pearl divers were indeed being stalked by a shark. 
Just as it seemed the person was about to lose their life, Captain Nemo stepped forward. This surprised I because during this time, the captain had shown a strong aversion to humanity. However, in this critical moment, he didn't stand idly by. He safely returned the pearl diver to the small boat and even gave him a small bag of pearls. This act of saving a life showcased a different side of Captain Nemo's character. Despite his professed disdain for human contact, he didn't hesitate to intervene when needed, revealing his hidden sense of chivalry and courage. The Nautilus sailed to the Red Sea, and I and the captain discussed the origin of the name Red Sea. The story of the Exodus in the Old Testament of the Bible recounts the tale that Moses led the Israelites to the sea, and with the staff given to him by God, he stretched it over the sea, causing the waters to part, allowing the Israelites to pass through. The pursuing Egyptian army was then drowned when the waters closed in again, turning the sea red with their blood. However, this is, of course, a legendary story. In reality, the Red Sea's surface occasionally appears red due to the seasonal presence of large red algal blooms, creating a phenomenon like a sea of blood. Captain Nemo also mentioned the Suez Canal, which wasn't a modern idea. It was initiated during ancient Egyptian times but abandoned several times. The Suez Canal was eventually completed in 1869, connecting the Red Sea to the Mediterranean. However, at this moment in the novel, the Nautilus couldn't yet pass through the Suez Canal. Still, Captain Nemo assured I that it would take just two days to traverse from the Red Sea to the Mediterranean. How was this even possible? Filled with skepticism, I followed the captain into the control room. The captain himself took the helm, and in the depths of the ocean, he found an entrance guarded by shrimp and crabs. The Nautilus boldly entered the dark corridor, and when it emerged from the other side of the passage, it had arrived in the Mediterranean. This, of course, was Verne's wild imagination, but people of the time, just by reading the novel, could imagine a mysterious passage emerging in the unknown depths of the sea and were immensely thrilled. In the 20th century, underwater tunnels became a reality, like the Channel Tunnel between England and France, which not only accommodated cars but also trains. Once the Nautilus entered the Mediterranean, I, overwhelmed by homesickness, began contemplating escape. Ned Land, the harpoon expert, relentlessly encouraged this plan. They made a secret plan to escape in a small boat that night. I anxiously awaited the right moment, still feeling a tinge of regret and reluctance because this would mark the end of the wondrous underwater journey. As the agreed-upon time approached, Captain Nemo unexpectedly invited I to help salvage treasure from Vigo Bay. Vigo Bay is located in northwest Spain. In 1702, a joint fleet of English and Dutch ships defeated a combined force of French and Spanish ships there, sinking the recently returned Spanish treasure fleet from the Americas. A large amount of silver sank to the seabed, making it a popular destination for modern-day treasure hunters. I thus learned about the source of Captain Nemo's immense wealth, but one mystery still puzzled him. I had witnessed the captain hand over boxes of gold to a mysterious diver. Who was this person, and why did the captain give him money? Unable to escape, I continued the underwater journey and encountered the legendary Atlantis. The ancient Greek philosopher Plato first mentioned in his dialogues that there was once a continent in the Atlantic Ocean, Atlantis, but it was submerged overnight due to floods and earthquakes. Whether this is a legendary tale or a real event remains unconfirmed to this day. In the novel, Verne depicts what he imagines the highly advanced ancient civilization of Atlantis might have been like. As the story reaches this point, our expedition is nearing its conclusion. Verne, departing from his earlier measured narrative pace, introduces a series of sudden events that drive the novel towards its climax. First, the submarine runs aground in the Antarctic. With oxygen running out and lives hanging by a thread, they manage to escape from the ice cavern just in time. Next, a massive octopus entangles the submarine's propeller, leading to the tragic death of a crew member during the struggle. Before everyone can fully recover from the emotional blow of losing their comrade, Captain Nemo makes a daring decision. He decides to pursue a warship. At this point, several mysteries that have been looming throughout the story finally begin to unravel. I learns that the Lincoln, the ship they were initially on, 
was intentionally rammed and sunk by the Nautilus. I was locked up again because Captain Nemo was preparing for a new attack and was concerned that I might interfere, and Captain Nemo had been residing in the submarine for a dual purpose. Escaping the world and seeking revenge on humanity using the submarine as a weapon. I helplessly watch as the Nautilus rams the warship, resulting in the deaths of everyone on board. Feeling disillusioned and determined to leave, I is on the brink of escape when the submarine encounters a massive maelstrom in Norwegian waters. Fortunately, I, Consile, and Ned Land manage to escape in a small boat just in time. Amidst the violent turbulence, I lose his consciousness. When I awaken, I find myself in a fishing village cabin, and the journey of twenty thousand leagues under the sea comes to an end. Captain Nemo and the Nautilus, which accompanied I on this extraordinary journey, remain unaccounted for. The story abruptly concludes, leaving lingering questions in I's mind. Did the captain intentionally steer the submarine into the maelstrom? Had he given up on life? And ultimately, what was the purpose behind all of the captain's actions? All these secrets sank with the Nautilus to the depths of the sea. The mysteries left unanswered at the end of the novel were not deliberate obscurities, but rather the result of a disagreement between Verne and his editor, Hetzel. Verne had originally conceived Captain Nemo as a Polish hero rebelling against Russian rule with his wife and daughter having died as a consequence. However, Hetzel, mindful of potential Russian readers, suggested portraying the captain as a hero who rebelled against slavery instead. Both refused to compromise, leaving these mysteries unresolved. Fortunately, in his sequel, The Mysterious Island, Verne added further details, revealing that Captain Nemo was actually Dakar, a prince who rebelled against British oppression in India. After the failure of the Indian uprising, he constructed the Nautilus and sought vengeance by sinking warships. Now that the story is complete, let's step out of the protagonist's perspective and address the initial question. Aside from its scientific value, where does the literary value of 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea by Jules Verne manifest? The literary value of 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea by Jules Verne is first and foremost evident in the characterization of the novel's key figures. Verne invested a significant amount of effort in shaping the character of Captain Nemo. He is portrayed as a complex and enigmatic figure. Captain Nemo cares deeply for his crew but shows ruthless cruelty to his enemies. He professes to loathe humanity, yet he intervenes to save the protagonist and the pearl diver. He keeps a photograph of his wife and daughter in his cabin, displaying a poignant attachment to them, yet his primary motivation appears to be rooted in hatred. Creating such a multifaceted and tragic character can be challenging, as internal contradictions can lead to incoherence. However, Verne masterfully provides Captain Nemo with a larger context as a vengeful hero, which rationalizes his actions and creates a complex and unforgettable character. While deliberately designing a mysterious background for Captain Nemo, Verne scatters various details throughout the story, inviting readers to decipher the puzzles, enhancing the novel's readability. For example, earlier, we mentioned that the protagonist, during a library visit, notices that Captain Nemo has an extensive collection of books but curiously lacks any political works. By the end of the story, it becomes clear that this absence is due to his aversion to politics. Additionally, Captain Nemo was shown handing several crates of gold to a mysterious diver. This action, when viewed in the context of his character and motives, suggests that he may have been supporting a revolutionary cause. Verne cleverly constructs a series of mysteries, hooks the reader's interest, and eventually unveils the answers. Furthermore, he leaves one puzzle unsolved, reserved for a sequel to address, ensuring that readers would continue to purchase magazines and novels. While these techniques are common in genre fiction, Verne employs them with skill and avoids falling into clichés, making his work timeless even years later. In contrast to the enigmatic character of Captain Nemo, the protagonist I is relatively plain in terms of character development. I compliments Captain Nemo, forming a contradictory yet complementary relationship. The protagonist is a naturalist, while Captain Nemo is a brilliant inventor. Their differing perspectives and interests create tension and drive the plot forward. Furthermore, Verne projects his own aspirations onto the protagonist, 
most notably by having I fulfill his dream of exploring the depths of the sea. The novel also features two functional characters, Consile and Ned Land. Consile provides humor and helps set the tone, while Ned Land, whose name implies a connection to the land, symbolizes the strong desire to escape. When the protagonist hesitates between staying and leaving, it is Ned Land who tips the balance towards the leave side. Beyond the intricate character development, Jules Verne's work entered the purview of philosophers such as Roland Barthes, Michel Foucault, and Jean-Paul Sartre after his death. Through their interpretations, Verne also became a representative figure in cult culture. In cult culture, certain niche works are revered or worshipped by specific groups due to their unique charm, subsequently influencing mainstream society. Roland Barthes, in his work Mythologies, said Verne constructed a closed universe with its independent time, space, and principles of existence. He continuously perfected this world, filling it with meticulous detail, showcasing human inventions and devices. How should we understand this passage? In simple terms, pioneers of science fiction like Jules Verne, who is represented here, create a self-contained world within their texts. For example, in 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, Verne, as the creator, constructs the world of the Nautilus, filling it with all the elements of daily life and even establishing unique aesthetic norms. Verne brings this world to life in the text, making it so vivid and believable that readers are willing to live in it. If we do not narrowly define literature, then undoubtedly, science fiction authors like Verne, who diligently explore worldviews, fulfill the essential role of literature. Finally, let's briefly analyze Jules Verne's dialectical attitude towards science. Verne was a visionary with a high level of scientific literacy. In his era, he enthusiastically praised and embraced technological progress, believing that people could use the power of technology to conquer nature and reach farther and deeper into unknown territories. For example, they could dig the Suez Canal, altering the Earth's original structure, and harness electricity to bring numerous conveniences to human life. He believed that technology boosted our confidence and satisfied our curiosity, ultimately giving us wings of freedom. In many of Verne's optimistic descriptions, human liberation seemed imminent. However, we should also see that in some passages, Verne did not blindly extol the power of technology. He also reflected on the conflicts between technological progress and environmental conservation. For instance, the novel mentions humans excessively harvesting seafood, and Captain Nemo also engages in extensive underwater coal mining. At the time, people naively believed that there were endless resources in the vast oceans, but Verne keenly captured the hidden concerns of human society. The giant octopus in the book can be seen as a symbolic warning when humans take too much, nature will deliver a fatal blow, making humanity realize its insignificance and hubris. In the 21st century, Verne's concerns have indeed been confirmed, and marine resources are gradually depleting. People have once again turned their gaze toward outer space. However, Verne lived in the 19th century when the overall tone was one of technological optimism and boundless opportunities. Verne did not intentionally avoid dissonant notes in his works. Most of his reflections were due to his intuition as a literary writer. Literature is a reflection of humanity and Verne's deep contemplation greatly broadened the scope of 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. Although Verne was not officially recognized as one of the immortals by the French Academy, his literary heirs, the science fiction authors who followed him, have to varying degrees become his spiritual successors. Regarding science, whether in praise or reflection, his successors have continued further down the path that Verne pointed out. All right, this concludes our analysis for this issue. Let's recap the key points from the content. 1. Jules Verne, H.G. Wells, and Hugo Jernsback are often collectively referred to as the fathers of science fiction by later generations. However, Verne himself didn't consider his work to be science fiction. More accurately, he used 19th century scientific and technological knowledge to create adventure novels. 2. Verne used imagination and scientific knowledge to construct a self sustaining underwater world. The exploration of the underwater realm takes place inside a submarine called the Nautilus. The submarine's illumination and power are entirely electric, 
and the residents of the submarine derive all their necessities from the sea, such as using seaweed for mattresses and squid ink as ink. 3. The literary value of 20,000 leagues under the sea is primarily manifested in three aspects. First, the meticulous characterization of the complex character Captain Nemo and the captivating narrative, reflecting Verne's rich imagination. Second, the creation of a self-contained and vivid miniature world in the text with unique value systems. Third, Verne's dialectical attitude towards science. The novel both praises the power of technology and reflects on the relationship between technology and environmental preservation, as well as the relationship between technology and humanity. Well, that concludes the content for this episode. If you enjoyed my video, please click like, subscribe to my channel, and share it with your friends. Thank you.